Okay, welcome everybody to uh, <coughs> a one in our series of public lectures at, at ICERM. And uh, it's, uh, I'm Jill Pfeiffer, I'm the director of ICERM, and it's a real pleasure to um, welcome tonight's speaker. Rodolfo Torres received his PhD in mathematics in 1989 from Washington University in St. Louis. He, holds po he held postdoctoral positions at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences of New York University and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, and moved in 1996 to the University of Kansas, where he advanced a full professor in 2003. His research interests include Fourier analysis, applications in partial differential equations, signal analysis, and biology. He specializes in the study of singular integrals, function spaces, and decomposition techniques. Through his research collaborations in mathematics, he has given numerous lectures around the world, and his interdisciplinary work in biology has been covered in the media in articles in the New York Times and Discovery Channel online. His research has been supported by several grants from the National Science Foundation, and he regularly mentors graduate and undergraduate students <coughs> and has, been, has received various teaching awards for his efforts. He uh, is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and in 2012, he was appointed Associate Vice Chancellor for Research at his university, and he also serves as a Vice President of the University of Kansas Center for Research. So he's a multi-talented individual, and I'm so pleased to welcome here, uh, Rodolfo here tonight to give this lecture on the color of birds. Well, thank you very much Hill, for such a kind introduction and um, thank you all of you for coming uh, to this talk. Uh, it's a fantastic setting. It's my first time at ICERM. I also want to thank ICERM for inviting me, giving a chance to visit here and um, a chance to talk to you about uh, some of uh, this research. So, um, as, as Jill introduced me, you, I'm a mathematician, so um, you may be wondering um, what is a mathematician doing with birds? What is he talking about? And I sometimes wonder that myself too. So um, I see many uh, familiar faces in the audience, many uh, experts in, in some of the areas in which I work. So, um, but I also see some uh, people, some young people. So I hope I can present something that is of interest to all of you, independent of, of your background. <coughs> And um, I will try to keep things down to air mostly and, and of course if someone uh, wants to know more technical details about uh, some of the topics I will present, uh, we can talk um, after I'm done with the presentation. So um, the main reason why I'm involved with this is because of uh, uh, a collaborator and dear friend of mine, uh, Richard Pram, uh, is the guy with the bird there. Um, he is an ornithologist. He was at the natural, he's a curator of ornithology, he was at uh, the Natural History Museum at the University of Kansas. He's now at the museum, uh, the people of the museum at Yale. And uh, he came one day, um, he was interested in understanding the coloration of bird. All his life has been about understanding bird. And he came one day to my office, knocked at my door, and, and said, you know, I read some paper in which Fourier analysis appear. And I look on the web and you claim to be someone that knows Fourier analysis, so can you explain this to me? And I say, well, I, first I thought, this guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. He has uh, no understanding what, what I do. How he possible understand? But everything, he, he's a very bright guy, and everything he thought, uh, he didn't have the math background to understand it, but um, he was right on almost everything. Um, he said. And the reason this, the way this happened is through collaboration with many other uh, people and many biology, but in particular with the students. So this is something I enjoy very much of, of this research that um, it took place really uh, in Great Pie by uh, this other fellow. I show a picture there. Uh, his name is called Williamson. Uh, he was an undergraduate at the time when we started, uh, majoring both in biology and math. And so he sort of was the person that was able to translate between the two of us. So we couldn't understand each other, but he could, and he will talk to us 
and, and help us. And for, it's very sad, we lost him uh, in 2008, but I always like to remember him when I talk about this. Um, he was at the time a professor at Cornell. Okay, so who could not be interested in bear? They're so beautiful. Uh, look at this color, it's just some image I took from uh, a public website on, on the web, and you know, this, this color are amazing, right? I mean, um, uh, it's incredible, really, and, and you know, uh, uh, for those of us who are fortunate to, to see colors, uh, you cannot help being amazed by uh, how can this be, and there are many reasons um, how, there are many ways in which these colors are produced. So um, it's very different the way warm colors, yellow, red, oranges, uh, are produced versus uh, cooler colors like green and blue. Um, so the purpose of, of this talk is to explain the greens and the blues, not the other color. I will mention something about the other, but I will talk about mainly bluebirds. So, I'm from Kansas, and uh, <laughs> there have been always a great interest um, on bluebirds, and so you may recognize from the Wizard of Oz, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing, but um, Dorothy, at the beginning of the movie, is, is watching some uh, bluebirds, and he's singing, and she say, somewhere over the rainbow, bluebird fly, uh, bird fly over the rainbow, why then, or why? No, she doesn't say can I, she say, why are they blue? <laughs> that was a, a different version of the movie. So, where are they blue? Um, well, even, you know, children books. Uh, so, this is a libro de las mil y un preguntas y respuestas sobre los animales. Um, sorry, from now on the talk will be in Spanish, so I hope. <laughs> Look at the translation, sir. Uh, no, this is a book that my kids had. So when they were little, we, we used to read about this. And essentially say, I mean, essentially give you the whole answer uh, without many details. It says, well, it depends which color. They are the red and the yellow and the orange. They are produced by pigments that the animal have. Usually these pigments come with the diet. Um, you may have seen flamingos that are pink. Uh, sometimes when they're in captivity, they cannot eat the right food, so they lose their color. Then there are the browns and black, dark color. These are just by uh, the absence of any pigment. It's just the melanin in their skin and under their feather that absorb all this color. And then there are the blues and the green that is just there. Uh, it's just the light reflected. The light with that wavelength is reflected. So, which is essentially true, but uh, it doesn't say much how this takes place. So that's essentially a simple explanation. If you go to a classic book, uh, in ornithology, it's a very old book, um, it says more or less the same. Um, it says that blue in feather is apparently never the result of blue pigment. And uh, up to today, uh, we still haven't seen, uh, and we have looked at many, many birds, uh, we haven't seen any pigmentation uh, that is blue or green in birds. And <clears throat> then it goes to say, uh, the color lay layer throwback reflect blue light, but other wavelengths pass through the layer and are absorbed by the dark pigment below. So again, um, it's indicating that it's not the presence of a pigment. So you look at my jacket or essentially any blue that you see around you is the presence of some pigment. That's why it's blue. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, um, how do they know? Because, you know, other color, you can strike the pigment and the feather are colorless, or you can illuminate it with light of different color and see that that's not the case. So there's no pigment, so there is some other reason. And is the reason, as we're going to see, is how these tissues in the feather and the skin of birds and other animals are structured at very small scale. So there is a lot more to that, right? So, yes, it's true that the light is being reflected by white. So I'm going to give you in this slide the punchline and the whole story. So um, after this, if you're bored, you can just go to sleep. You have seen it all. So, but I'd like to tell you where we're heading, because uh, we're going to take some detours before we get there. So I'm going to look at the skin, the, this waddle around the eye of this bear. And I'm going to look at microscope, uh, electronic microscope images of the bear. Um, and then we're going to say, is this blue? Yeah, you say, well, I'm seeing it's blue. What are you asking about? 
Um, and then we're going to use uh, some mathematical tools, uh, uh, especially something called Fourier analysis. And we're going to look at an image like this. And then we're going to compare to some measurement, right? So if you do physics, you want to measure something and compare with your model and see if that explain. And then it's going to explain it and we say, oh, yeah, it's blue, right? And so um, you may wonder, why well, we, we knew from the beginning. So why, why are you doing this? And I'll get back to that uh, later on, why my colleagues are doing it because it's very cool and, you know, give me a chance uh, to work in something that usually I don't work in. But I, I'll tell you why my colleague uh, is so interested in explaining the coloration and how it happened. Okay, so um, going back to Dorothy, uh, you know, I'm going to start talking about things that are really outside my comfort zone, but, you know, over the year I grew to be able to do it, I think. And so you may remember this other instant of the movie where the house gets blown away by the tornado, and then when they land, she opens the door and see color. It was one of the first movies in Technicolor. And what does she say? Oh, come on, somewhere. This is in Kansas. <laughs> this is in Kansas anymore. Actually, last night I was in, in a restaurant. Uh, people know this quote. So I was in a restaurant, and someone asked me, where are you from? I say, I'm from Kansas. And she said, oh, you're not in Kansas anymore. So I say, yeah, that's. <laughs> OK, so I'm, I'm not in Kansas anymore, but I will try to explain. So we'll need to talk about several things. And each of these uh, probably will to do in, in, in you know, well, in, in full detail, we'll take a full lecture like this for each of these, but I will talk about um, colors, I will talk about lights and wave, a little bit about image processing, Fourier analysis, probably the only thing I'm perhaps qualified to talk about, and then I'll talk about vertices and coloration. Okay, so it's going to be a fast uh, tour through all this theme, but I hope I can give you a sense of idea. Um, okay, so colors, right? Uh, here's a quote from Van Gogh. There is no blue without yellow and without orange. And I would say also without red and without cyan and without purple. So we usually see many colors together. And that's my attempt to produce an impressionistic uh, picture of a rainbow over the Niagara Falls. And this is something we have seen many times. And I, I've, I'm sure you like it to see, it's, it's very appealing to see all this color, but you may wonder uh, several things. One of them is, well, not all the colors are there. Only some colors are on the rainbow, and I will try to explain that. Um, so a little more detail, what's happening is light gets dispersed by particles of water in, in the atmosphere, in the case of the rainbow, or you have seen this experiment where light passes a prism and disperses light, and then you see this, this rainbow, this uh, wave uh, this light being spread into different uh, color of light with different wavelengths. So the thing is that um, light doesn't have a color. Um, it's our perception of this electromagnetic wave, how it affects our sense of vision that send an image, send something to our brain that interpret this and make us understand it as a color. Um, so the light per se doesn't have any color, but uh, different wavelengths, uh, light of different wavelengths, affect our senses in a different way. And um, I'll come back to this in the next slide, but um, we have in our eye these rods and cones that are more sensitive to electromagnetic waves that are um, of the wavelength of red, green, and blue color. But it's really amazing that birds, and also we'll come back to this, have a fourth one that is sensitive to UV. So, light beauty color are in the eye of the beholder, and really in the eye of the beholder. And um, uh, although I cannot know for sure how you sense a particular color and how you see, we all refer to the same color, unless we have some uh, vision problem that prevents us from seeing some color. Um, we refer in the same way. So it's the way we experiment this. Um, how about the other colors that are not in the rainbow? How, how these colors are produced? Well, there's two ways. And there are, many thing, there are many ways to produce color, but the way the color themselves get produced from some other one, there's two basic different ways. 
Now, I, I always experience that based on your age, uh, you're more familiar with the one on the left or with the right. I mean, I am, revealing my age, more familiar with the one on the left, on your right. Uh, and those are the color by subtraction. So let me explain those first. Um, this is what happens when you mix paint of things that uh, have different pigmentation. Um, and this is something we experienced when we were little and we were playing with crayons. And, you know, we were told the primary colors were uh, blue, red, and yellow. They're actually magenta, cyan, and yellow. It's close enough to red and blue. Um, and so the way it works is that uh, when you see something green, uh, it's because, like plants, they have chlorophyll. They, you see green because uh, there's something in the substance or the paint that is absorbing the red part of the visible light. And so what is not being absorbed, what is reflected is what we see. So, for example, if you mix something that is green, that, that means uh, it's absorbing the red, with something that is red, actually, uh, magenta, which is absorbing the yellow and the blue part of the light, then everything gets absorbed, and so you see black. Well, I'm sure you have all tried when you were little, to mix all the colors in your crayon book, trying to make black, and I doubt you achieve black, you get some brownish, horrible color. Um, and in fact, although that's the case, this is why printers have these three colors, and also they have black. They don't try to produce black by mixing the other color. Okay, now, the picture on the other side is what we call color by addition. And it's what I'm going to be talking about. So I, I will go through this because I want to make sure that we understand uh, how we're going to be looking at color. And is, this is produced when we mix lights of different color, right? And so with the advent of color TVs and computer monitors with color and so on, we are more familiar with this. Every color gets coded in the computer. There are many ways to do it, but sometimes with an RGB uh, code, so red, green, and blue. And so it's the combination of these colors that produce the other ones. And the combination of the three, of the, all of them, it produces just the opposite of light. Now it's white, right? All the color. Okay, so that's the way, the color by addition, that the way we're gonna be looking at coloration because is, again, the effect of the light, not the presence of pigment that is gonna produce our blues. Now there are many blues, again, so you know, have uh, a picture from uh, Picasso blue period, and that, again, that's produced by the paint, it has pigment that produces the blue. That's not the blue I'm gonna look at. Uh, the blue I'm gonna look at is more like the blue that you see on the top. Um, this is um, an opal, a piece of an opal. Um, so the opal has inside a sphere of uh, silica that are very ordered inside and produce this color. Now, if you ever have one in your hand or you look at it, you see what sometimes called the flame of the stone that change color depending on what you're seeing. Um, the colors we're gonna be analyzing will not have that property. They will not be iridescent. They will be the same color no matter the angle of observation. And then, that's too very simple because there are many other situations, these are color class that, you know, both effects could take place. There could be some presence of some pigment and then some other physical structure that um, help you um, amplify some colors. Okay, so um, I mentioned already that um, light, we're gonna think of light as a wave, and so there are some parameters or some um, particular quantities associated with uh, a wave that we need to talk about. Um, so one of them is the wavelength that I mentioned already, I think intuitively or explicitly you know what I mean. It's just the distance between two peaks or two valleys. Uh, it's the period of the length of the period in a mathematical term of the wave. There is a velocity, so where electromagnetic wave in vacuum move at the speed of light, but they get slowed down in the media uh, by something called the, re the index of refraction or refractive index, so the velocity is C divided by that, they move very, very fast. 
And the wavelength, um, and there's also idea in Rodi, there is something, the amplitude, so that's the high of the wave that give you an idea of the intensity of the wave. Now, uh, the wavelength we're talking about, these distance are, are really very small, and they're usually measured in nanometer, which is 10 to the minus 9 meter. Very, very small um, quantities. So there are many um, electromagnetic waves that uh, we found in, in our life. We experience some of them we are able to sense, some not. In the visible spectrum, so the ones that we see, it's very small, really. We can only see waves as associating a color to it in our brain of waves that um, have wavelength from 400 in the violet to uh, about 700, 650 in the red. Now, every individual is different, so we cannot say exactly everybody sees this. Some people, there are variations on which color you can see, uh, but this is pretty typical for humans. Interestingly enough, uh, birds has a different, and essentially every animal has a different visible spectrum. So they see, um, because of what I mentioned earlier, the presence of, of a receptor that is more sensitive to UV light, they see part of the UV part of the spectrum. So they see substantially below 400 nanometers. So um, this is rather amazing. So imagine um, the, the color the birds must, must see, right? I mean, it's uh, something like ultra green or, you know, ultra yellow, a combination of UV and yellow or green. Something, it's like a four dimension, right, in terms of color. Something that is hard to imagine what they may see. Okay, so as I say, we only see a small um, portion of all the electromagnetic wave. Uh, of course, some others we are familiar with, the UV light or uh, infrared, um, X-ray, so those are very small. Uh, radio waves are very large in the meters of scale. So there are kind of ways some of them are very bad for us. Um, other pass through us without causing us any trouble. So only the ones between 400 and 700 are the ones we see. Now, another important thing, uh, it help understand uh, some of the analysis we're going to do, is that we perceive sound very different from the way we perceive light and our visual image of images. So our ear can distinguish many sounds, can distinguish different notes, but also can tell about, or I not claim I can do it, but you have people that are trained and skillful, you can also distinguish an accord, right? A chord. So even though it's made of different notes, it sounds different than each individual note, but you can know from the core which notes are being played. Okay, so even though you see the collective sound, you still identify the individual notes in the core. With light, it's not like that. We see the final result. So here, for example, I describe uh, several ways of making the color pink, which is not a color in the rainbow, of course, but you can mix magenta with yellow, well, but you can do magenta by mix, mixing blue and red, and yellow by mixing green and red, or you can do white and red, and you only see the final result, you see the pink. So there are many ways to combine other color and produce the final outcome, and we are not able to tell. We are only able to tell the final result, okay? With our eyes. So there are instruments to measure the intensity at each wavelength or each frequency um, of the light, and, and these are just artistic rendered. These are not real pictures, but um, I couldn't find one that it was uh, um, in open source that I, can, uh, that I can put in the picture, so I, I just created these myself, so they are uh, made, but, but are pretty much what they are. So, uh, for example, we see daylight or an incandescent light, they both look white, but the way they are white is very different. The intensity of each, so I plot this thing, uh, the relative intensity in terms of frequency, so frequency is the reciprocal of wavelength. So the higher the wavelength, the smaller the frequency is how often a wave oscillates during the period. 
So as you see, um, the ingredients that form the lie, uh, although we both see them as Y, are very different, right? So here, every color is more or less present with the same intensity. Here, they go down to the UV part of the light. Of course, the light looks different, right? Some, some lights look more reddy, some will look more bluish. Um, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to look at these blue birds and look at these spectral power distribution and see how blue they are. Are they blue because every color is there and there's some blue? or they are blue because it picked all the blue. It's really blue in that sense. Our eye cannot tell the difference, but this spectral power distribution will. OK, so um, because the light is, uh, uh, light is a wave, it's going to interact with uh, obstacles and will encounter different media. So um, there are many um, effects I just described three of them here. Uh, one is diffraction, and this is sometimes referred to as the bending of light um, on the edges of an object. And this is um, what creates some shadow that we see around objects. Uh, then there is interference, which is uh, the constructive reinforcement and destructive cancellation of way when they are in phase or not. And this is typical when you see hummingbirds or when you see uh, some oil or water on the ground, and depending from where you see, you see different colors. Uh, it's because depending on the angle that you're looking at that, waves interact with each other and um, reinforce each other or cancel each other. And then there is scattering, uh, which is essentially the spreading of light by small particles. And for example, the color blue of the sky is produced by the scattering of light through small particles in the atmosphere. So uh, the combination of all these effects is what we call, uh, is, you know, colors produced by the combination of all these effects is what we call a structural color. So again, the snow pigment is the physical interaction of light with the medium. OK, so here is a cartoon. I'm going to show you several cartoons. Um, try to explain uh, scattering. So as I say, the dispersion of light by small particles. So um, light with a small wavelength, light blue, is scattered a lot more than light with large wavelength. So imagine this situation. So instead of talking about uh, light uh, and wave, just imagine you have a crack on the floor. And you roll a big basketball over the crack. It's going to ignore it, right? The size of the ball compared to the size of the crack uh, is so different that they are, in mathematics, we'll see they are orthogonal to each other, but you know, they ignore each other. They don't see each other. Now, if I roll a very small ball, a ping pong ball or something like that, then as soon as it hit the crack, it's going to jump, right? It's going to be scattered. Why? Because they have physical dimensions that are more comparable to each other. So this is what's happening in the atmosphere when light from the sun hits. And so there is a formula that tells you what is the intensity of the scattered radiation. And it varies like 1 over the fourth power of the wavelength. So remember, wavelength and frequency are reciprocal to each other. So the larger the wavelength, the smaller is going to be now the intensity of the scattered light. And so since it's lambda to the power 4, um, that's, that's a huge power. So blue light, I compute here, um, of uh, 450 nanometers is scattered six times more than red light of 700 nanometers. So if you look, if you were to look at uh, the spectral power distribution of the, the light we see when we see blue of the sky, you're going to see a peak at the blue, right? And the purple, right? Go And the UV. So it's not blue that all the energy is concentrated in blue there. It goes to the blue. Right? OK. So, but this is um, what we call, this effect is what we call incoherent scattering. There's no order. There's no structure. It's only this, the size or the variation on refractive index on the medium where the light is um, incident that produces this scattering. And 
This has been since the birds I'm going to look at are not iridescent, so their color doesn't change with the angle of observation. It's not like hummingbirds, right? If you can see hummingbirds, it changes where uh, you see them. Then this has been used to explain the coloration of blue and green bear. Without even looking at the tissue at the right scale, people assume, oh, there must be some, you know, some structure there, some very small particle that scatter the light, so it's blue like the sky is blue. And we claim that's not the case. Uh, we claim that uh, are produced by coherent scattering. So it's not that just every wavelength is scattered, only certain ones are scattered in a way that reinforce each other. So here is the situation, what I'm trying to say when they reinforce or they cancel. Imagine you had two waves equal the same uh, wavelength, and they are perfect in phase, so they go, both go up and down at the same position. Then you combine both of them. Well, I guess I'm, I'm telling this story backwards. So let me start with, with the bottom part. So they go up and down at the same time. When you combine both of them, well, you get something that go up and down, but it's twice as high, right? They overlap and they multiply, they, they add their effect. Now, if they are completely out of phase, so one is up when the other is down and vice versa, and you combine them, you get zero, right? They cancel each other. So this situation, we claim, is what's happening um, with the non iridescent color of the bird. So, and why is that? Is because of the present or certain uh, structure at the right scale that um, this is what we claim um, made the blue light to be scattered uh, in a coherent way. So, how are we going to look at this? Um, you know, we cannot see with our naked eyes, we're talking nanometers, so we had to put this in a microscope, in an electronic microscope, and look at the right scale. So, um, what I need to do now is take another detour. I'm sorry. And um, give you um, a brief, very brief uh, explanation of what is an image and how we mathematically deal um, with an image, okay? And again, it's a sort of a cartoonistic approach, but I've tried to fit it in, in this lecture, okay? So, there's a lot more to that. So, what is an image? So, we need to work with an image. We eventually, we want to do some math, so we need numbers, right? We need to quantify things and do numbers. So, we're gonna think of an image uh, as a collection of numbers. So what are these numbers? Uh, this is a number that we assign to each pixel, and each pixel of the image will be color, some color, and we associate to that particular color a number. Okay, this has nothing to do with the color of the light, the things that we're talking before. Right? Just, I'm talking now about images and how we represent them. Now, in fact, it's not one number. It's, if you're gonna do a black and white image, yeah, you can use one number, but if you're gonna do a color image, you need three numbers again red, blue, and green, but let, let me make it very simple. So let's assume we are going to decide, you know, colors have a number associated to it, and we're going to put a number to each pixel of a picture. So uh, here is a very simple image. For example, I declare, and this may not seem, but just for the purpose of the example, I declare that I'm going to say purple is zero, uh, blue is a quarter, green is one half, and red is one. And so I put in one position, I put a quarter, so that should be blue, put zero, that should be purple, one half, that should be green, one, that should be red, and then I organize the number in a way I know. So here, I, what I did, I organized in such a way that I go from uh, left to right, and then to the left, left, okay? So I organize this number in a way, and I decide a color map, a color scheme. Um, and so here's the image, right? So I have four numbers, and I have quantified this image uh, with this number. Now, a more mathematical way to uh, look at this is by thinking that really this number represents a high. So it's what we call a function. So at each position we assign a value represented by the high. So remember red was one was the highest, so green was one half and so on. So it's like I have a landscape, right? 
And so I see this as a discrete function because it only takes a few uh, discrete number of value, but I can see this as, as a landscape, right? And what I have at certain height, I mean a certain color, where at the valley very low, I have a different color, and so on. So we want to think about function because that's what we do then in mathematics. We work with this function and do some analysis of that. Now, of course, this is a very crude image. It's just a four square, so these are very large pixels. They, they don't tell you anything. But in fact, if we make the pixels smaller and smaller, and use the same thing, we, we can represent any image we want. So, so here is a process that, you know, uh, I don't know how much you follow basketball, um, college basketball. Um, probably this image is hard to recognize anything. So I'm going to make the pixel, pixel smaller. Um, and I don't know, at this point, at my university, everybody will know what I'm talking about. Uh, and of course, if I make the pixel even smaller, I get something that you recognize, the mascot of the best basketball team in NCAA. We'll see that in March. So. Anyway, so what is this? Again, this is a function, right? It's a function of what we call two variables. So of course, this is the uh, KU Sheikho. And here is the picture that I, I was talking to you about as if we're putting this thing horizontal and we see as a landscape, right? Um, the high of this peak, this mountain, represent the color that we are, and so a different color um, has a different height. And you see now I have very small pixels, so this starts to look more like, you know, really landscape, continuous landscape. Still it's discrete, but now we're getting closer to something we can use some analytic tools that um, perhaps will help us analyze it. Is this clear? More or less, how, what an image is and how we look at it. Okay, so if it's clear, someone is going to tell me what this landscape, what image this represents. Imagine you're seen from the top. You see some bright spot here and some bright spot there. It's a smiley face. Very good. It's a smiley face. Very good. Okay. All right. So, functions, functions. What do we do with functions? Okay, um, we're going to take a function and decompose it into simple one. Yeah, you know, this is very dangerous. Mathematician, when the mathematician says simple, well, <laughs> not always means simple, but um, we want to be able to express a very general function like these images that are very weird landscape um, as a combination of functions, other landscape that are very particular that we understand very well. That's why we call them simple. And then we make a linear combination of them. We're going to say, OK, it's like having a recipe for a cake. I have this ingredient, which are labeled F1, F2, F3, and so on. Imagine they are egg, sugar, flour, whatever the cake takes. And then the amount of each are these coefficients, these other numbers, V1, V2, V3, and so on. So I want to be able to write a recipe to make an arbitrary function. So you give me a function, and I want to be able to describe it as a combination of functions that I know and understand very well, and how much of this, each ingredient I need to put in the mix to generate this function. OK? So let me start with a function of one variable. Instead of having an image, an image is a function of two variables, because it's a landscape. I can move this direction or move that direction. So every point has two coordinates where I have a height. Let me start with something simple, a function of one variable. Think of some, some way that change in time. So it's just a function of one variable. Since we're going to be looking at way, we start with the hope, and this has been done for many years now, um, to represent a function as a combination of very particular way. If you don't know what the sine function is, I'm going to show you a picture in a second. But these are this function from trigonometry that mathematicians understand very well. And we are going to say, well, our intention is to describe any possible function of one variable, no matter what it is, as a linear combination of this sine function, which are some oscillating waves. And the numbers, again, are going to be the ingredients, how much of each of these particular functions I need to use to reconstruct a function. And that's all what I need to know. 
So all what I need to know is are the ingredients, because the, the amount of the ingredients. The ingredients are fixed. The first one, let's say, is eggs. The second one is flour. The third one is sugar. The fourth one is butter, and so on. I just need to know what is big one, how many pounds of sugar, and so on, I need to add to the mix to form the function. Now, I put this dot, 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 because I don't want to use too much notation and so on, but really to be able to do this, uh, and this is what Fourier analysis is all about, we need usually a series. We need infinitely many terms. So I don't want to enter into what does it mean to add infinitely many terms, but just think that your ingredient, the amount of the ingredient you put, gets smaller and smaller that after a while you cannot see the difference, right? You, you just put a pinch of salt, probably you're not going to feel it. So that is what's going on. Anyway, this is an area of mathematics that up to today uh, is investigated a lot. In which way we can represent function and in what sense these representations are true and correct and can be used for many things. It's, it's a subject of, even today, research in mathematics. So here are the sine functions, um, dimensions. So this is sine of pi x. So it's just go one full cycle between minus 1 and 1. And so here is 2 pi. So I keep on adding a number here. That is the frequency. So it's, it go up and down twice. And I put 3 pi, go up and down 3 times. Put 4, go 4 times, and so on. So I'm claiming, I'm telling you, uh, that any function, I'm not going to say what does it mean by any function, but any function can be represented as a superposition of this oscillating wave. That is very hard to believe. If you never, you know, if you're a mathematician, that's everyday life for you. But if you're not, um, and you never heard of Fourier analysis, I don't think it's something that is easy to digest and believe. Um, because you may say, well, how about things that don't oscillate at all? Okay, you're telling me any function can be represented this way. Let's start with the simple of all. Let's start with a function that is constant. So if I cannot reproduce that, I probably cannot reproduce anything, right? So I should start with the simple of example. How can I make a constant function made out of things that oscillate a lot? Well, the, the key here is that we're going to use infinitely many of them. So here is how it goes. So we start with the function 1. And I want to approximate it uh, with oscillating sine function. So I start with the first one, sine uh, of pi x. I'm only looking at the interval 0, 1. So I put this green one here. And I multiply by a constant. We'll get to that later. Uh, so it has a particular high. And so if you look at the green one, you may say, oh, that, that's not a very good approximation of the function. One, it only is equal to one here and here, and maybe near to those points, I come close to one, but look at here, look at here and here. I mean, that's a very poor. If you're going to tell me the function, the green one, you're going to use for an approximation of the constant function, you're doing a very poor job, right? That's very bad. OK, how can we improve this? Well, I can add another way. So in this part, we are below one. So I can add some stuff to push this curve up. And where I'm above 1, I can subtract something to push it down. OK, so I take it the green function and trying to squeeze it up and down. I do it with another way. OK, so I have here. Well, it goes a little bit better, but still not so good. And I now repeat the process. Where I'm up, where I'm down, I add some positive stuff. Where I'm up, I add some negative stuff, and so on. And we keep on doing it. And you see, it starts to get better and better, start to get closer and closer. So if you do this a lot, after I think here I put 40 terms, it starts to look very much like the function 1, right? With some caveat, there is this problem at the end point. There's always this overshoot. And the functions, all these sine waves are 0 at the end point. So I'm going to have some problem there. That's also a very interesting uh, topic in mathematics and what you can do to minimize this something that's called Gibbs phenomenon, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, at least inside the interval, we can get very close to the function 1 if I put enough of this way. If I put infinitely many of them, whatever that means, I'm going to get 1. 
So what I plotted here is the amplitude of these coefficients, the amount of each wave that I make up, in terms of the frequency. And this is a very typical picture for functions that are very smooth, very regular, like a constant function. So there are many coefficients that are zero. That, that is because of some particular parity that this function has. That's not really important. What is important is that as we increase the frequency, the amount of a wave that, so as I move to, in that x axis, the wave will oscillate more and more. The amount of that ingredient gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is very typical. You have the limit for thing, but it's, hard, it's not hard to uh, see why. It's, I mean, something that is very smooth, like that, I mean something that changes very slowly, um, doesn't oscillate widely or anything like that. You don't need waves that oscillate very much to reproduce it. So eventually we can stop and say, okay, this is small enough. I only use finitely many terms. Even though I will need infinitely many terms to get one, I can live with a good approximation with enough uh, finally many ones. So here is another cartoon. So let me show you how we use some of these to uh, filter signals. So let's say this is the function, a signal that I have, and um, a recorder or something, I digitize, and I see, you know, it doesn't look right, right? All this wiggling around, maybe it should be just a nice curve like this. There are all this wiggling all this noise. So what I can do is look at what we call the Fourier transform. I look at the magnitude of this coefficient, and I connect it, compared to the previous image, I connect it to a line just for visual purpose, but these are really points, right? And I see that, you know, there are some low frequency that are high and some other one, and then they go to zero very quickly, and then I see for higher frequency these values. So what does it mean? This is saying that in the buildup of my original, the picture that I have with the noise, there are some highly oscillating waves. That maybe is responsible for the noise. So in order to try to filter that, what I did next is I remove it. So I set to zero this ingredient. Imagine you have a, a cake and it has some sour taste, something that doesn't taste right. Imagine you were able to remove that ingredient. It's very hard, right? When you already bake the cake, you cannot do it. But imagine you remove that, and then you hope it's going to taste right. And of course, I wouldn't be showing you the picture if that wasn't the cake. Of course, this is a cartoon, because I put the noise there, so I know how to remove it anywhere so far. In practice, it's a lot harder, and it's almost, it's not almost, it's an art. It's part of science, but it's part of an art, how to remove noise. So, um, but again, this is one advantage of this analysis we do by transforming this function as a combination of some function that we understand very well in terms of the ingredients of the function that let us filter the situation. Okay, but I want to talk about images, so I want to move to function of two variables, and we do the same. Uh, except that now we're going to use sine function that are a function of two variables. So these are two-dimensional ways now that move in different direction with different frequency. But the goal is the same, to represent the function by many of these waves, two-dimensional waves, um, and just look at the coefficient of uh, each of these waves. So this is how they look like now. The basic component, my sine waves, are, are waves, like the ocean waves, right? The two-dimensional wave that move in different directions. One oscillate very fast, one some oscillate very slow. Okay. Now, just take one of these. What would the image of one, just one of these, way will look like? So again, think this wave is a landscape, and you're looking from the top, how, what kind of image you will see for each of these ones. Someone? Say? Stripes, right? You see a bunch of stripes, yeah. So this is how they will look like, right? The one that was very fast, you will see thinner slide, thin, um, uh, and, and the one that was less low. So this look a lot, I always mention it when I say, it looks a lot like my black and white color TV when I was little, right? They always will go like this, and you need to fix that. 
So, it's hard, again, it's hard to believe, and I'm not going to try to show you that it's true, but it's hard to believe that I'm saying now, combine all these sine functions, this wave in different direction with different frequency, with the right ingredient, I can generate your face, or your face, my face. Any image that you want, as the same way I wrote the function one as a combination of sine, I can take any image you want and combine it in the right way, in the right amount, all these stripes I can generate. And that's a theorem, but we're not going to prove it. But it's true. So again, what we do is we represent this image as um, a combination of things that we understand very well, this oscillating wave. And so we take the image, which was originally a set of numbers. Remember, I assign a color to each pixel and a number into another set of numbers that are the ingredients of the sine waves that I used to represent it. Why do we do that? Well, because we may recognize pattern, we can filter the signal, we can compress it, we can do many things that we like to do an image by working with these numbers. Okay, so this is just an example of uh, many of the mathematical tools related to image processing, things that affect your life every day. Every time you download a picture or send a picture or text someone a picture in your phone, you're using some of these techniques, whether you knew it or not. Okay, so one cartoon about filtering with this signal, um, with this um, tool, um, is the following. So again, I have an image with some noise. And so I now look at the numbers. So this is the Fourier analysis of this signal. So before it was a one-dimensional thing. Now it's a two-dimensional analysis. So what this picture means is I look at some direction from the origin. They are in the middle. And it tells me a wave in that direction, how much of that wave contribute to the original image. So the color here indicates, again, the value of the coefficient. And what do I see in particular? OK, so a nice image like this usually, again, will be a low frequency image that will not be for high frequency many values. So yellow is high, red or black is, is low. So, but I notice all this point, right? At high frequencies, so they are far away from the origin, I see this high value. So maybe. That means that there is a way oscillating very fast and being added to the picture. <clears throat> Maybe it's creating this distortion. So again, I filter it by removing it. Actually, I didn't remove it. I did something more sophisticated. I make an average of the nearby neighbor, but it doesn't matter. So I remove it, and then voila. I use those ingredients. So I remove the ingredients that I didn't like in my recipe and I get a much nicer picture, OK? All right. So after all this tour, we come back to the birds. <clears throat> and so we're going to look at this part here of this waddle. So we look at these little things, and we're going to look inside them, or some of the other birds, too. Uh, so. I'm looking at each of these waddles, and now I see that inside them, uh, this picture, unfortunately, I couldn't get a better one. They're hard to see. They have more and more resolution, but there's some white stuff. Unfortunately, it doesn't show that well. Uh, these are collagen fibers. So if you look at a small scale, uh, the best way I had to describe it is like you have a bunch of spaghetti, right? And so there's all these parallel fiber. They're not straight. They bend around, but they all go in bunches together, right? So there is a very long cylinders that are twisty, like wire around. Uh, they are more or less all of the same diameter. And they're very long compared to the diameter. So if I take a cross section of these, um, this is what I see. So imagine you have a bunch of spaghetti, you cut it. Uh, oh, you cannot see here. <laughs> here is what it is. This is what we see. Okay. Now there are many physical considerations here that simplify the problem. I start with the three-dimensional problem: the fact that these are very long fiber compared to the diameter, and the way lies polarized, and so on. 
uh, allow me to reduce with some approximation to a two-dimensional problem. So my image now that I'm going to analyze using Fourier analysis is this image. It's the cross-section of this fiber. Now, how you will describe this image? It's a bunch of circles, more or less of the same diameter, and at more or less the same distance from each other. Now, they're not perfectly periodic. They're not perfectly organized like a crystal, right? They're not exactly in position that are at the same distance from each other. But they're more or less at the same distance from each other, right? It's like if you start with something very periodic, imagine you put a ball, and then you shake it a little bit, and then they move a little bit around. So it's very homogeneous in, in another sense, in, in the sense that it doesn't have a preferred direction, right? If, if I make you very small and put you inside there, you wouldn't know where you are. Every, every neighborhood looks the same, right? It's very homogeneous in that sense. If these were very perfectly ordered, it will be very easy to uh, estimate and measure what should be the wavelength of the light that gets scattered the most. And this is what is called Bragg law, and it's what is used to explain the structure uh, of crystal when they are illuminated with X-ray. And so I will not go into the math, but um, what I want to say, so imagine you have two atoms or two particles and then lie of, the, of a particular wavelength, hit on them at a particular angle, then um, these two waves travel different distance. So if you draw a line here, you'll see that there's a piece here and a piece here that is an additional distance that this wave has to travel compared to this one. And so when you perceive it, when they arrive to you, they're going to be in sync or not, depending on this magnitude, the angle and the distance between the, the two atoms or particles. And the formula says that to be in sync, they had to verify that the wavelength is twice d, this is this distance here, times the sine of the angle um, in which the light is incident. Now, the important thing of this is that it gives you a way, very simple way, to relate a physical dimension, a physical dimension of your structure material, the distance between two particles, with the length of the wavelength. So it relates this to quantity. This is a quantity associated to the wave, the wavelength. This is a physical dimension. So to be in phase, this wave had to be satisfied this relationship. And this is why the angle affects thin, because this is why when you see, for example, in, in an oil slick or, or water slick, you see, depending on the angle, you see different color, because this relation will be verified as this angle varies for different wavelengths. Okay. So we want to do something similar with our tissue, which is no perfect order like a crystal. It's what we call quasi-order. And so to do that, uh, we use a method developed, or a theory developed by uh, a physicist at MIT that uh, in the 70s studied the transparency of the cornea, so in the human eye. And the tissue of the cornea is very similar, but the scale is much smaller. And so he developed some physics and math uh, I won't have time to go over that, to explain why the cornea is translucent and why there are some illnesses, it gets opaque and, and it changes the structure. So we are going to try to relate, uh, again, a physical dimension in the structure of the tissue with the wavelength. So the best way I had to explain this is uh, by looking at this mechanical model. Uh, that is people jumping on a trampoline. So um, imagine uh, a situation like this. Well, maybe this is two order, but there's a bunch of you standing at more or less the same distance from each other on a trampoline. And here comes this big mechanical wave, and it's going to start hitting the trampoline. So you're going to start jumping. As the wave hits you, you're going to start going up and down. And then pass it, it takes some time to get to the next guy, and they are at a different distance, so it may take longer. So as the way progresses, you're all going to be starting uh, to go up and down. Now, if the frequency of this way is in tune with the distance 
at which you are, maybe after a while you all jump up and down. You resonate, right? You all jump up and down um, in the same way. Now, if you are completely dispersed, then it will be a mess, right? One will always be high, up and down, and nothing will happen. Okay, so the real situation is it's a little more complicated, and I think I'm running out of time, so I, I, I want to, can I take a few more minutes? So I want to skip uh, some of it, but uh, this was probably for the mathematician in the audience. Um, so uh, we have an incident uh, field, and it will generate an oscillating dipole at each of these uh, circles that we think as delta masses, and some of the field will be transmitted, some scattered at a different position, and it's the combination of the effect of all these uh, particles at different positions that generate um, the final field. So um, I'm going to skip the math, um, but um, what I'd like to say is that when we go through this analysis, we see that a uh, certain wavelength um, is going to be scattered backward, so in the direction of the observer. Imagine the bear, the light comes from very far away from the sun. The bear is very far away, and the light I see back uh, is scattered to me backward. Um, is related again to the predominant wavelength present in the tissue. So the predominant distance between these circles. And how we measure that? We measure that by looking at the Fourier transform. We, let, we measure that by seeing what are the predominant ingredients. Remember, the Fourier transform tells you about which wave form this image. And so we're going to see which is the predominant wavelength that is present there. And when we see that, uh, we see a picture like this, these concentric rings, and we see most of the energy concentrated in some particular frequency. That you can really see in the picture, right? There is a predominant distance between. And so uh, this predominant uh, frequency, we compute the corresponding wavelength using the index of refraction of the material. Um, we obtain the color, supposedly the color of the bear. So um, I'm going to go quickly with this. We did this with many bears, and in all we have a similar situation. We have this very um, ring-like structure. With this exception, this corresponds to this one, which is almost periodic. It's amazing how perfectly ordered this is. Um, I won't go over that right now because of reason of time, but most of the other are, they have this ring stripe. So if you measure the highest predominant frequency, it tells you something about the color. So um, for me, that was good enough, um, but we wanted to compare to uh, the actual spectral power distribution that we can measure. So here, we came up with some idea how to do it. So we wanted to compute, compare this picture with the spectral power distribution, uh, which is the blue line that you see in this picture. And so what we did, we did some radial averages of the image to get a one-dimensional thing. Um, and to me, it's still rather amazing how close some of these things come. So, um, so the blue one is what you measure with spectrophotometer. Uh, the yellow one, the orange one, is what we compute during this Fourier analysis. So uh, we think that the Fourier analysis was made based on the physical model, and I think this sort of indicate or corroborate that our model is precise, and that's the reason why uh, the bears are blue. Now, notice that this peak around 450, which is the blue, the wave uh, frequency blue, but it's a particular kind of blue. It's not like the blue of the sky. It's really blue. It's peaking at the blue, right, at the blue color. OK, so uh, we did this with other things. We look at um, coherent scatter of UV light. As I told you, bears see into the UV part of the spectrum. So this is very cool, because there are bears that look black to us, uh, but they don't look black to them, to themselves. They can recognize uh, the color, and they, they have some UV colors. Um, we also look at mammals. 
when you go to the zoo, I'm sure you have seen some baboons, some monkeys that have some very notorious blue parts that are uh, not very nice to show, so I censor those pictures. Um, and then we also look at uh, butterflies and dragonflies. We haven't done blue whales right yet, but I don't know, maybe some other time. Um, so uh, this was kind of primitive analysis. None of us was a physicist. Um, then uh, my colleague Rick Brown worked with some physicists and engineers. He took this to Argon Lab. He actually measured, you know, irradiated this with X-ray, and so we have more uh, proper verification. We also study, or they study, how uh, that most of the light is scattered backward was, as we were making this assumption. And although there's a slight iridescent in many of these tissues that we don't appreciate with that, there's some iridescent, but it's very little. So again this speak of the, um, the effect that the tissue is more or less homogeneous, right? Uh, it's not perfectly ordered, and that is why uh, there is no iridescent. Okay, so just a few words of why, um, why biologists want to look at this. Um, so, um, so how birds use this color? They, they use it as a display. Right, in their display behavior, uh, they send a signal, right? Uh, many of them using their mating behavior, uh, they are a way to attract their partners. Um, and so the hypothesis that uh, bright color in the feather and skin of bird play, since they, um, they play a role and this structure that generate in turn the color, uh, how they are formed and how they evolve, they may have evolved through sexual selection. So um, now it, this is even controversial. I mean, uh, are they just trying to be pretty or are they trying to communicate something? So it's like um, you wear a nice Armani suit. Uh, maybe you can impress someone. It shouldn't be the case, but maybe because what are you communicating? Say, well, I can afford, uh, not this, this is not our money, but <laughs> I can afford this our money suit, and I mean, I'm very wealthy. I can provide for your offspring, so you should make with me because I'm going to be a really good father. Um, when the color comes from the diet, that may be a good reason to think that way. You say, you know, this guy knows how to acquire what it takes. Um, some of the display and some of the color are hard to justify that way. In any case, uh, the female preference, and, and this is not a sexy statement, it's, it's true in, in, in most birds, the males are the more colorful and the female are the ones that choose. Uh, uh, who to mate with. Um, of course, they cannot decide on the structure, right? So um, they decide on what they see, this, the reflectant spectrum, which I've, I find it very interesting because it's like they're choosing on the Fourier transform of the guy. So I used to tell my kids when they were going to the dance school, I said, you know, comb your Fourier transform before you go because maybe in that way um, you will be more attractive. Anyway, um, I, ha I like this quote by Darwin. So in his second book, The Descent of Man, where he tried to explain and came with the idea of sexual selection, uh, it's amazing, and many people have mentioned this, how many reference to uh, aesthetic and beauty uh, Dar Darwin made. And in this particular quote, he say, on the whole, uh, there appear to be most aesthetic of all animal, excepting, of course, man, and they have nearly the same taste for beauty as we have. So in fact, my colleague Rick Pram argue, and this is something he's spending a lot of time talking about this day, is that there is a co-evolution of beauty, right? That they're just really pretty, and they evolve to appreciate this uh, beautiful color, and, and the maids that are more beautiful are the most attractive. In any case, um, I also like this, this quote from Fourier, um, who is who invented this method for the analysis? 
uh, in the 1800s, and he said, if the order which is established in this phenomenon could be grasped by our senses, it will produce in us an impression comparable to the sensation of musical sound. And I really think it is fascinating to observe how Fourier analysis and synthesis manifest itself in nature. And the nanostructures, so this order, in biological tissue uh, as perceived as vivid color, um, which are centrally as aesthetical pleasing as what Fourier refers as the sensation of musical sound. So um, the sky was earlier blue and uh, had turned black now with the night, but I saw this picture that uh, really matched my color scheme, so I want to finish with that. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, so there are some uh, colors that are produced that way. Um, there are some yellow and red, but um, mostly, usually, they are produced by pigment, not by oil. And one reason may be, I mean, it's hard to explain, but one possible explanation is that, um, so to produce red, let's say, in this way, um, the structure had to be at much bigger distance from each other. So the predominant distance would have to be comparable to red wavelength, which is much larger. So maybe it's very hard in nature to grow this tissue and keep that order at such long, relatively long distance. So uh, maybe the, you know, nature find a better way to produce red and yellow by uh, Pigments, right? There was someone question. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, thanks for this. A very interesting talk. Uh, I'm more of a birder than a mathematician, but much more of a birder. But so, how can you have an albino blue jay? An albino blue jay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it, it's, I, I, the, the honest answer is, I never studied it. I don't know, but. Um, I believe it's just uh, this structure, for whatever reason, is not present or is distorted. I mean, it, I believe it's the same as this thing I briefly mentioned about the transparency of the cornea. Uh, some illnesses develop some opacity, opac get opaque, um, and it's because the fiber get distorted. They are distant between the fibers, right? So probably this, this has the fiber um, I would say much, much closer, and that distort this, this blue color. Yeah, that's a very good question. It would be very interesting to look at. Um, um, yeah, this question something. Yes. So, uh, there were uh, in one of the Yes. No, I mean, that, that's a great question. Uh, and and I, I was running out of time, so I didn't want to mention that. Let me, let me try to get back to that, because it's, it's incredible that nature will produce such a um, perfectly ordered structure, right? Oops, I'm going too far. OK, here, here it is. So, um, so here it is, this tissue here, which has, of course, those, those of us who are mathematicians know that you, know, you have a lattice here, so the Fourier transform is also going to be a dual lattice for that. And so the peaks are going to be uh, very periodically structured. So that, that puzzled me in particular uh, a lot for, for a long time. And then we realized that, uh, no, it's not iridescent, but the pictures will suggest that, right? Some, there is a predominant frequency, but at a certain angle. The thing is that we are only analyzing here one bunch of these fibers. And these fiber in the tissue run in all different directions. So we really, what we see, and it's very hard to come up with the model to account for that, is it's a, it's a combination of a bunch of fiber going this way, a bunch of fiber going this way, a bunch of fiber going this way. So the average of all these make a circle, probably, and not just this thing. The important thing, though, is that by being so periodic, it's much more intense. So these are a lot bluish than other, than other feathers. And, and this is, I, I wasn't involved in that, this is some, some other stuff people have done. And you know, they are, um, they have evolved to produce. So 
the ancestor of this bird have evolved to produce this, this blue. So they are really trying to be more blue, so to speak. Uh, so again, this is the, probably the effect of sexual selection. So if I'm blue, you like me. So the more blue I am, the more you're going to like me and evolve that way. Fantastic question. <laughs> um, yeah, the bigger discrepancy, um, it's hard to tell again. I mean, um, these are just samples, so uh, many things could have happened to the final. Overall, I, I had another transfer that I decided not to include. Overall, we um, always undershoot uh, a little bit what is being measured with the spectrophotometer. And we think that in part is well, it's just an approximation, what we're trying to do with the model, but what we think is that these tissues shrink. So when you cut it and they get dry and so on, uh, they may have shrunk a little bit enough to affect the measurement. And the other errors are just measurement errors and you know, all, the, uh, all the approximation that we do. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have a better uh, explanation of that. Yeah, there are some that, have a, but I, I'm trying to be honest and show you all, right? I could just, just show you the ones that, that match very well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, that, that's the, the, the general, we, we wonder, and we, we repeat the experiment several times, and it was always the same. So, yeah, I, maybe it shrunk or maybe some other reason or um, but these are these are good you're picking on the on the right thing I like that thank you <laughs> any other questions thank you